uh, great to talk with you virtually and uh, sort of hopefully in video. Um, I am going to talk with you for the next, say, 40 minutes or so on the cognitive and mood aspects of Parkinson's. All right, I think it's recording. Okay, so so even even until even in the 1800s, people just didn't live into the, into the ages when conditions like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's are most likely to occur. But just in the last hundred years or so, there's been a, just a dramatic change in the average lifespan. It's gone from in the 30s to into the 60s, and it's led to one of my favorite statistics, which is that. For the first time on planet Earth, there are now more people alive over the age of 65 than there are young children under the age of five. Through the history of our human species, it's been much more common for there to be a lot of young people than old people. And now people like me in the, in the older age group are starting to take over the planet. And that is generally a good thing. It means we're all living longer. But it's also a bad thing in that these proteins that can build up in the brain are more likely to build up with age. And although I'm not going to go into it in any great detail, there are broadly speaking three sets of proteins that can build up in the brain. One is uh, amyloid proteins, and these amyloid proteins are most likely to build up in Alzheimer's disease, but they can also uh, lead to small bleeding in the brain, a condition called amyloid angiopathy. There are another set of proteins called proteins with tau, and these include frontotemporal dementia and a couple of other rare causes of dementia, and they can build up in the brain as well. But in particular today, we're going to be talking more about synuclein, the protein that builds up in Parkinson's disease and in the Lewy body diseases. And, and uh, this synuclein, builds up in these Lewy bodies. Can you guys see my, if someone could type in the uh, chat or the other window, can you see my mouse when I move it around? I think you should be able to. Excellent. So, so I am pointing right now to two Lewy bodies, these pink inclusions right over here. So when we talk about a Lewy body disease, that's what we mean is one of these Lewy bodies. And this is in a nerve cell or a neuron that has this brown speckling. Uh, called neuromelanin. And this brown speckling is, means that this is a pigmented neuron. And this is a pigmented neuron from the substantia nigra, this part of the brain that it actually looks dark brown just to the naked eye. And in someone who's passed away who didn't have Parkinson's disease, this is what their midbrain looks like. It has this nice brown stripe in the midbrain called the substantia nigra, or the dark substance. And in someone who has Parkinson's disease, these cells that have the neuromelanin, they get killed eventually by the synuclein. And so their substantia nigra is no longer uh, uh, dark. It's actually shrunken down and, and starts to disappear. This is the midbrain of someone who's passed away from Parkinson's disease. So these proteins, these, this, uh, this Lewy body, is chock full of alpha synuclein, this protein that has misfolded and built up in the brain. And one of the a sort of scary but also fascinating stories of these neurodegenerative disorders is that these misfolded proteins can spread through the brain. Um, so they spread very gradually, but they start in one area and then spread from nerve cell to nerve cell through the brain over time. So in this right-hand side is how amyloid, or something we sometimes, sh by, for shorthand, called a beta, how amyloid spreads through the brain in early Alzheimer's disease. And in the middle one is how tau can spread through the brain in the diseases that we often call tauopathies or tau diseases. And the last one is in how synuclein can build up and spread through the brain. And if you look, it starts in the earliest stages in the brain stem, this lower part of the brain that's really 
practically just above the spinal cord. And then over time, it spreads to the midbrain, and then it spreads out to the cortex. This is synuclein, or the Lewy bodies containing misfolded synuclein. They're literally spreading through the brain. But they actually start in a, in a brainstem structure, uh, uh, not always, but often called the, the vagus nucleus. And I'll, I'll explain why that's a fascinating story to us, because it may explain a little bit about how Parkinson's disease could start. So proteins misfold and they build up in the brain, but one of the other stories that we've learned about the neurodegenerative conditions is that they often start building up many years before someone has symptoms. So for instance, in Parkinson's disease, it's really very common that well before someone develops motor symptoms, that they have symptoms in other areas. In three broad areas that often happen very early, years before the motor symptoms, are what we call anosmia, or the loss of sense of smell, constipation, and a sleep disorder called REM behavior disorder. REM behavior disorder is a condition where in REM sleep, normally all our, all our voluntary muscles are paralyzed, but in REM behavior disorder, they're not all paralyzed, and we're actually able to act out our dreams. It turns out, uh, this is a fascinating condition, I'll just talk about it a little bit more. So the way this presents is, the person who's sleeping doesn't notice anything, but they're actually moving around while they're dreaming, and their bed partner, the other person in the bed, does notice it, because they often get hit or, or kicked by the person who's acting out their dream. So REM behavior disorder can begin 10 or 15 years before the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease, Constipation often, are, often occurs well before, and anosmia, or loss of sense of smell, often occurs well before. And I just want to zoom in on constipation because it's really rather fascinating. It may have told us a little bit about how Parkinson's uh, could be starting. So it turns out that constipation is present in about half of the people who are diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. And as I mentioned earlier, it often precedes the motor symptoms by about five to 15 years. Now, constipation is awfully darn common. It's not the case that everyone who's constipated is going to develop Parkinson's disease. But people who have significant constipation are, you know, for multiple days, are at a higher risk, about three times more likely to eventually develop Parkinson's disease than people who are not. And fascinatingly, fascinatingly, the protein that we've been talking about, synuclein, can build up in, in, the, in the nervous system of the gut, in the parasympathetic nervous system of the gut. Now, you might say, well, wow, how, what does that mean for the brain? Well, remember, we talked about how these misfolded proteins can travel from nerve cell to nerve cell. So a group in Sweden, raise the interesting question, is it possible that alpha-synuclein is traveling, starts in the gut, in the, in the nervous system of the gut, in the parasympathetic ganglia, travels up the vagus nerve, which is the nerve that connects the gut to the brain, and then pops up in the, in the nucleus of the vagus, which re you'll remember, earlier I said, the first place it shows up is, is it in the vagus uh, nucleus. Sure enough, the vagus nerve connects to the vagus nucleus. So they said, is it possible that this disease, at least in some patients, is literally starting in the gut and then finding a route of entry into the brain through the vagus nerve? If that was the case, then in patients who had the vagus nerve cut, they might not be able to develop Parkinson's disease because literally the proteins can't get up into the brain. Now, it used to be many years ago that people would do a surgery called a vagotomy or a cutting of the vagus nerve for people who had bad ulcer disease. And a group in Sweden looked to see whether patients who have had a vagotomy were less likely to develop Parkinson's disease. And indeed, they showed that they had about half the likelihood of developing Parkinson's disease than people who did not have a vagotomy. Now, this is crazy fascinating. 
And it's still a hypothesis. And one point, one question I often get from people with Parkinson's disease is, should they get their vagus nerve cut now? And obviously that doesn't make any sense at all because uh, if you have Parkinson's, the protein's already gone past the vagus nerve. But it is an intriguing piece of evidence for how Parkinson's maybe, maybe is starting in the gut, maybe from, 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 from changes in the microbiome or in things we've eaten, potentially pesticide um, exposures. So this is one of the intriguing pieces of evidence of how these misfolded proteins can first start in the brain. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, Parkinson's disease and cognitive impairment. I, I'll sometimes use the word dementia. Let me just define that right now. Dementia means when someone has uh, uh, significant memory problems that are so severe that they're no longer able to do all their day-to-day -day functions. And Parkinson's disease can sometimes lead to dementia. It does not always. And it often affects cognition or cognitive functions. Not bad enough to cause dementia, but enough to be bothersome for patients. But there's an interesting history here in that in the very beginning, when James Parkinson was first uh, uh, defining what Parkinson's disease is, back in 1817, he didn't think that cognition was affected at all. Uh, uh, but, but as long ago as 150 years, when Charcot uh, did more studies, he thought that indeed the psychic faculties uh, can be impaired from Parkinson's disease. And broadly speaking, if Parkinson's disease is going to get bad enough to cause dementia, then we call that Parkinson's disease dementia. There is another term out there called dementia with Lewy bodies, and that refers to people who develop cognitive symptoms and often visual hallucinations but they have little, if any, motor symptoms. And so these two disorders have different names, but in the brain, they look very, very similar. Um, there's a number of symptoms that we use to help define uh, the dementia of Lewy bodies, but I don't think they're really critical for today. Although I would say a, a couple things, we've already talked a little bit about some of them, like REM sleep behavior disorder. And often people with, the, with these conditions have visual hallucinations. They often see animals or people, especially in the dark. And we'll talk a little bit more about that and how that can be managed. All of these people have fluctuations in cognition and they have problems with cognition. That, that's how we define them as having a, a cognitive impairment. There's some risk factors in people with Parkinson's for eventually developing significant cognitive symptoms. One is age. Um, there's a hand raised if you have a question. Uh, I'm getting all kinds of good questions. Is there a question? Uh, I am gonna answer all the questions later. I don't think any of them are appropriate or need to be answered right now. So some of the risk factors for developing cognitive symptoms in Parkinson's disease, one is age. Another is early hallucination. So if someone has Parkinson's disease and they start developing uh, visual hallucinations early, that's always a little bit of a worrisome sign that they're gonna develop more cognitive impairment. It turns out having REM behavior disorder is also a little bit of a risk factor for eventually developing cognitive symptoms. And people who have lots of posture and gait problems are more likely to develop cognitive symptoms, whereas people who have more tremor and more symptoms on one side of the body than the other, they're less likely to develop cognitive symptoms. Also, people who have early visual spatial problems. Uh, problems, you know, parking the car, it gets angled all wrong, you know, uh, having a hard time sort of finding a, a, a specific um, tool in a, in a pile of tools because everything looks all jumbled to them. Early visual spatial problems is also often a sign of developing cognitive symptoms. In terms of the prognosis, there are various factors that, that, that are likely to lead to worsening cognition and then some others that are actually protective. And I want to talk about some of the protective ones now. And a number of the questions have also been geared towards this. 
what are the steps that we can do to try to prevent memory loss, particularly in Parkinson's disease? But some of this is more broadly um, applicable just in general in terms of how to prevent uh, uh, memory loss as we age. So there are some risk factors for dementia. I believe, although it's not been fully proven, that these are also risk factors for dementia in Parkinson's patients. But obesity, smoking, high blood pressure, and diabetes are all risk factors. You might say, these aren't only risk factors for memory loss, but I actually thought these were all risk factors for heart disease or stroke. And indeed, one of the most important things that we've learned over the years is that things that are bad for your heart are also bad for your brain, whereas things that are good for your heart are also good for your brain. And I'll talk a little bit about some of those. Uh, so that we can go over them. So in terms of diet, to begin with, the diet that seems to be best for the brain is the Mediterranean diet. And this has been studied very well in what's called a randomized controlled trial. That's a research study where people literally got randomized to whether they should stick with their own diet or, or change to a Mediterranean diet. And in fact, in this study, in the PREDIMED study, uh, they looked at whether people had a, a heart attack, a stroke, or some other cardiac problem. And the people who stayed on their own diet kept having more and more of these problems, strokes and heart attacks over the years. Whereas the people who stuck to the diet did better. And they actually compared two forms of the Mediterranean diet. One that involved extra virgin olive oil, and one of them that involved particularly lots of nuts, lots of almonds and nuts like that. And both, both of the Mediterranean diet groups did much better than the control. Now, this, this part of the study looked mainly at heart attacks and strokes, but there was another part of the study that looked at cognitive symptoms, like co frontal cognitive abilities and global cognitive abilities. And again, what they saw was that people had the control diet got worse over time, whereas people who had either of the Mediterranean diets, either the olive oil focused ones or the nuts ones, they didn't seem to decline much at all. In fact, some of them, there was even a hint of improvement in cognitive function over time. So diet seems to be one way that, uh, that we can do something to improve uh, uh, our memory and prevent it from getting worse over time. Another one is exercise, and this obviously is particularly relevant to Parkinson's disease because there's good and growing evidence that, that aerobic exercise is, uh, can help to slow down Parkinson's disease. But it also turns out that aerobic exercise is good for the brain. And in a randomized controlled trial that looked at older people who didn't have dementia or Parkinson's disease, who were randomized to either doing exercise or a control intervention where they did just stretching but no aerobic exercise, what they found was that the people who were randomized to do exercise, their hippocampus, the part of the brain that's critical for memory, actually got bigger over time. And the patients who were randomized to not doing exercise, their hippocampus actually shrunk over time. In addition to the shrinkage, their memory got a little bit worse and this group's memory stayed at least the same. So we really think that aerobic exercise is also good for the brain and in particular, good for the part of the brain that's critical for memory. Finally, just recently, there was a study called the finger study that just came out a couple of years ago. And in this study, rather than just doing one thing like diet or exercise, or cognitive training, they actually tried all of the above. In the people who were randomized to the intervention, they, did, they, they were given information on how to keep a Mediterranean diet, they were coached on exercise, they were given cognitive training uh, exercises, and they, they had a long talk about how to minimize their vascular risk factors. So in this finger trial, they did all of the above. It was a two-year intervention, and sure enough, they saw that people who got the intervention did better on a cognitive battery, 
and especially they did better with executive function, the exact cognitive area that Parkinson's disease can affect. They saw it also in processing speed, but interestingly, memory didn't get so much better, but a number of other cognitive functions did with this multimodal intervention. And in fact, our Brain Fit Club has a number of programs to help people along these lines about going over cognitive exercises and strategies. I'll talk just a bit about how we diagnose these things. We now, for the first time, have uh, uh, some special kind of PET scans to look for some of these proteins that can build up in the brain. But so far, we can only find, um, we are able to do PET scans or special kind of scans for amyloid, uh, which can build up in the brain from mild to moderate to severe Alzheimer's disease. And we also have PET scans now that can measure tau. But for us, unfortunately, we don't yet have a PET scan that can measure the protein that we care about, which is alpha-synuclein. I will mention broadly that, that, that if Parkinson's disease exists at one end of a spectrum and Alzheimer's disease exists at a number of spec uh, other end of a spectrum. Some of these, there are in-between conditions like dementia with Lewy bodies and Parkinson's disease dementia, where Parkinson's disease is mainly, if not only, a synuclein disease. Alzheimer's disease is a disease of amyloid and tau. And these two conditions exist somewhere in the middle, where they have some amyloid or tau <coughs> and maybe some synuclein. And, and we have over the years learned that a lot of people as we age have more than just one condition, unfortunately. When we develop our cognitive symptoms, it's often due to a little bit of Parkinson's disease and potentially some Alzheimer's changes as well, which is why we can sometimes use these special amyloid PET scans even in people who have Parkinson's disease and cognitive symptoms if we suspect that there's some degree of Alzheimer's changes in the brain. And this was a nice study done by Steve Gompertz at MGH, a friend and colleague, who showed that amyloid builds up in patients who have Alzheimer's disease, but it also often builds up in patients who have dementia with Lewy bodies. And it builds up much less in people who have Parkinson's disease or Parkinson's disease dementia. Now, while people with Parkinson's disease don't necessarily have much amyloid in the brain, one thing that they do have is a lack of a chemical messenger in the brain called acetylcholine. This is a study that showed that people with Parkinson's disease, early in the disease, have a little bit of a reduction in acetylcholine. But as the disease progresses, the amount of acetylcholine gets worse and worse and worse. And in fact, one of the treatments to help the cognitive symptoms in Parkinson's disease are drugs that raise the amount of acetylcholine. And these are a group of drugs that we call cholinesterase inhibitors. These include rivastigmine, as well as another one called denepazil. They can have some side effects, including nausea and diarrhea, and they sometimes make the tremor a little bit worse but they're usually pretty well tolerated and they can make the cognitive symptoms quite a bit better. In fact, in this very large study of 500 plus people with Parkinson's disease and dementia, they showed that the people who were put on rivastigmine had a significant improvement in their cognitive abilities, especially compared to the people who got the sugar pill or got placebo. We often use denepazil as a pill but we, when we use rivastigmine, we often use it as a patch because if you take the pill, the, there's, a very, uh, there's a little bit of a problem with the blood levels. The way this works in this study was this measures the blood levels of people who took the rivastigmine pill. What happens is if they take in the morning, the blood levels get very high. They often have some nausea, and then, and then over time, the nausea goes away, but the blood levels go down. And then it's time for them to take their afternoon pill. And again, it goes up. And again, they develop nausea. And then it comes down. This up and down with the blood levels was a real problem. And so the people who developed rivastigmine uh, came up with the idea of using a patch, which leads to much more even blood levels. So very often when we use rivastigmine, we use the patch. 
Uh, Dinepazil does not have this problem, and Dinepazil leads to nice even blood levels. There are some other uh, symptoms beyond just the cognitive symptoms that can affect people with Parkinson's disease, and we'll talk a little bit about depression, but I do want to mention that there are a number of non-motor symptoms that are really a focus in the Parkinson's world these days, including symptoms like anxiety and fatigue and sleep problems, as well as sensory symptoms that we're all working on to try to help people function better. Um, some strategies to help when people develop cognitive symptoms. The first is uh, we've talked about how they, people with Parkinson's disease have a reduction in the amount of acetylcholine. So for sure, we want to make sure they're not on any medicines that make that even worse. So medicines like Benadryl or Tylenol PM, they can worsen cognition because they block acetylcholine instead of raising it. So we always look to see if people are on those kind of medicines and we stop them. We also always want people to be sleeping well. So we talk about their sleep to help with daytime alertness. If they have depression and anxiety, uh, we try to treat those. And if the cognitive symptoms are bothersome, then we use these cholinesterase inhibitors, these drugs that block the enzyme that, 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 that breaks down acetylcholine so they have the net function of increasing the amount of acetylcholine. Um, the one area that in cognition that's most affected in Parkinson's disease is something called working memory. And working memory is the ability to keep information online. Like if you have a telephone number that you're trying to keep in your head for say 30 seconds, people with Parkinson's disease often have particular trouble with that. And that's due to a, a both direct effect of Parkinson's disease on the chemical messengers that are important for working memory, and indirectly because things like depression and sleep problems can affect working memory. I thought I would just mention briefly the visual hallucinations uh, because they are a frequent uh, symptom in people with Parkinson's disease, but they also, they can be treated both by medicines that raise the amount of acetylcholine, like rivastigmine, but also there are a group of medicines called atypical neuroleptics, medicines like quetiapine in particular, or clozapine, that can treat the visual hallucinations. And recently, there's been a new uh, kid on the block to treat visual hallucinations, a treatment called, a medicine called pimavanserin. The main downside to pimavanserin is it's sort of brutally expensive. It's like nine, almost $100 for a single pill. Uh, but it can be helpful, uh, particularly if the atypical neuroleptics haven't, haven't been helpful. And there's, there's uh, data from pimavanserin showing that, that it can help uh, uh, prevent hallucinations. The last thing I wanted to finish up with in the last five minutes or so was to talk about mood in Parkinson's. And, this is my favorite uh, cartoon to explain one of the challenges in diagnosing depression in someone with Parkinson's disease. For those who can't see the, the type, it says, how to recognize the moods of an Irish setter. Happy, depressed, angry, pensive, excited, suicidal. And the reason why I have this cartoon here is because people with Parkinson's disease very frequently have what we call masking of faces or poker face, and it makes it hard to read their emotional states. And this can be even hard for their spouses to know whether they're feeling happy or sad. Sometimes, every time I ask someone with Parkinson's disease in my clinic how they're doing mood-wise, I am often surprised. Sometimes they'll tell me, doctor, I've never been happier. My mood is great. I went to see my daughter's wedding. It was the happiest day of my life. And I say to them, boy, I'm glad I asked because I would not have guessed that's what you're going to say. And other times people will say, doctor, I'm not so sure I can keep doing this. It's going to be too much. And in both times, they look the exact same. So it's really important for people with Parkinson's disease to let other people know how they're feeling, and especially if they're sad, because if they are depressed, we can treat it. And depression is very common in Parkinson's disease. Something like 40 to 50% of people with Parkinson's disease 
will have depression at some point in the course of their disease. And it's not due to the motor symptoms or even having a, a bad disease, because if you compare people with Parkinson's to people with other bad conditions, like bad rheumatoid arthritis, the people with Parkinson's still have more depression. And the reason why they have it is because of the brain changes from the Lewy bodies. Those brain changes lead to a reduction in dopamine that we talked about. They lead to a reduction in acetylcholine that we talked about, but they can also lead to a reduction in serotonin, the chemical messenger that's really important to mood. And because of that, uh, a large trial was held uh, about 10 years ago uh, looking at whether drugs that raise the amount of serotonin, SSRIs, can help depression and Parkinson's disease. And sure enough, they do. Everyone who went in the trial, their mood got somewhat better. Um, but the people who are on medicines like paroxetine, which is called Paxil, or venlafaxine, which is called Effexor, their mood got much better than the people who just took the sugar pill. So it's clear that people with Parkinson's disease respond well to this, this medicines that raise the amount of serotonin. So I wanted to save a lot of time for questions and answers. So I'm gonna just have two quick concluding signs. The, the first is, you know, as, as we all know, Parkinson's disease, the hallmarks of it are motor symptoms like stiffness and slowness of movement and tremor. But these non-motor symptoms like depression and cognitive symptoms often impact people at least as much, if not more than the motor symptoms. And they can be treated just like the motor symptoms can be treated. And unfortunately though, we don't yet have any disease modifying therapies. These are medicines that actually prevent Parkinson's from progressing. And I'm always humbled by this quote from James Parkinson that's now over 200 years old saying, there appears to be sufficient reason for hoping that some remedial process may ere long be discovered by which at least the progress of the disease may be stopped. What he was saying is because it progresses slowly, we should be able to slow the progression of the disease. And he wrote this 200 years ago, and it's humbling to realize that we still have not yet developed a therapy that slows down the progression of the disease, but there are some exciting new ones in the, in the clinic, and they are really aimed at what we now understand about synuclein and how it builds up in the brain, and, uh, and, uh, and that may be critical to finally slowing the progression of this disease. So with that, I will stop um, and I will start to answer some questions. I have to say um, that we've been getting great questions all along. One frustration for me is I don't get to hear some clapping, so I'm just gonna assume that everyone either hated the talk or fell asleep at some point in the last 40 minutes. Uh, that's my, my lack of self-esteem. But, but we will now open it up to questions and I will start answering them. So I'll start at the very beginning. We got a question early on about uh, Parkinson's disease and drowsiness. Is there any connection between that? And uh, this is a, a woman whose husband has been having sleepiness during the day. And yes, uh, there's a number of sleep problems that people with Parkinson's can have. We talked about one, REM behavior disorder, but maybe more important or more common is that people with Parkinson's often have sleep apnea, which is a condition with snoring and even pauses in breathing that can then lead to daytime sleepiness. So for sure, if someone's having a lot of drowsiness during the day, it's worth, it's worth talking with their doctor. And very often we will do a sleep study, a test to look at someone's sleep and see what, how efficient it is or how disrupted it is in Parkinson's disease because it's often treatable. For instance, sleep apnea, many of you know, can be treated with a mask that actually keeps air going into the nose so that the airway doesn't get blocked off so that people don't have apneas. The next question is, does high protein diet feed these disorders? That's a really good question. We do not yet know um, 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 what triggers um, uh, the disorder in the gut, but there is a little bit of evidence that, that, eat it, that, that pesticides can, that, that people are exposed to very high levels of pesticides. For instance, people who are um, 
who uh, work in the field, field field workers like uh, um, who who are literally there when this when they spray the pesticides, they can have a higher rate of Parkinson's disease, and it may be that it's coming in through the gut. Another question asked about how to treat the sleep disorder with sertraline or something else. I would say that you, the first step is to define better what the sleep disorder is. And I think that that, that would be the, the first step before we would uh, try to pick an intervention. Because as we discussed, if it's sleep apnea, there's a specific treatment for that. The next question is, is it true that people with tremor predominant Parkinson's disease are less likely to develop dementia. And that is in fact true. Uh, people who have tremor predominant or symptoms that are especially in the arms or on one side of the body are less likely to develop um, the cognitive impairment than are people who have trunk symptoms with early balance or walking symptoms. The next one is, um, can someone have both Parkinson's disease and Lewy body disease? And this is a real, a real challenge because um, the, a lot of, there's a lot of confusion around the nomenclature, but remember, uh, there are everyone with Parkinson's disease, essentially everyone has Lewy bodies in their brain because Lewy bodies are those little inclusions that have synuclein in them. So the way I think about this is that the largest category is Lewy body diseases. And within Lewy body diseases, we have Parkinson's disease without cognitive impairment. We have Parkinson's disease with cognitive impairment. We sometimes call that Parkinson's disease dementia. We have dementia with Lewy bodies. That's the, the cognitive impairment with very little motor symptoms. But all of those, Parkinson's disease, Parkinson's disease with dementia, dementia with Lewy bodies, all of those are Lewy body diseases. And, and I, the way I think of this is I use the word Lewy body diseases for all the diseases that can have Lewy bodies in the brain. The next question we have is, your list of risk factors does not include constipation. Did I miss something pretty obvious? So, so constipation is a risk factor for developing Parkinson's disease, but not specifically for developing uh, dementia. Uh, there's another question about medications that can remove alpha-synuclein. And indeed, there are some clinical trials going on right now. The most promising ones in my mind are the trials that are using immune therapies to try to remove synuclein. So these are uh, what we call monoclonal antibodies. These are antibodies that bind to synuclein and literally remove it from the brain. And there's one of those trials that's going on right now at the Beth Israel, and there are others that are starting. Uh, but yes, the goal really is to see if removing synuclein can uh, slow the progression or stop the progression of the disease. Next question is, what do you mean by sensory symptoms? Um, I didn't talk much about them, but patients sometimes have like a creepy crawly or, or tickly feeling in their legs. Sometimes they can feel as though their skin is, feels different to them in some way. Uh, someone asked me specifically about their uh, medicine regimen, and I, I think that Zoom is good for lots of things, but I don't think it's terribly good for making suggestions about medication. So I am not gonna, I am not gonna go there because I, I think I would be remiss if I thought I, I, I could tell from, from a Zoom chat what to do with someone's medicines. Uh, the next question is a good one. Is, they're all excellent, but this one is, the web seems crowded with brain puzzles and trivia games. How beneficial are these brain teasers? If beneficial, are there any you can recommend? And how much time a week is it worth spending, if at all? Boy, this is a real challenge. Um, there's been some research on this, but not a lot. What I would say is that I think staying cognitively active is really important but it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, one specific thing. And in fact, mixing it up seems to be helpful, doing different novel things. So for instance, it is not, it's not all that helpful to every day do crossword puzzles or do Sudoku and feel like somehow or another you've done exercise. It's better to, to mix things up. So uh, staying active with hobbies, maybe taking courses, 
uh, reading where, where that's uh, where you're, you're doing things that you like. Uh, that's what I would recommend. In particular, I think that it's super important to do um, exercises or strategies that you actually enjoy. Uh, because if it's, a, if it's something that you don't look forward to, uh, then you're very unlikely to stick with it and it's very unlikely to help you. Wow, getting great questions here. Uh, the next one is, can you comment on the medicine selegiline? Um, recently, it's been prescribed as one of the first medicines. Um, there's, selegiline has a very long and complicated history. Initially, we thought it might help to slow down the disease. I think that in general, we think now that rather than slowing it down, it can help a little bit to even out uh, the, 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 uh, the highs and lows that Cinemat can have. Uh, so it's sometimes used for that. Next question is, what are the best medicines uh, to treat this other than levodopa and carbidopa? Boy, you know, it's interesting that levodopa, carbidopa, cinnamet, the very first medicine that we developed for Parkinson's disease now 60 plus years ago, still remains one of the most effective ones. And uh, if I were to develop Parkinson's, that's probably the medicine that I would pick for myself. There are a number of other medicines, though, that we have that can smooth out or level off um, uh, the, the levodopa, carbidopa. Uh, those are medicines that, like Enticapone, there are different forms of levodopa, carbidopa. There's Cinemet CR. There's a new medicine called Ritari, which can help to even out the amounts of Cinemet. Uh, but it still remains the most effective one. And we, there used to be a lot of use of dopamine agonists. Those are medicines like, like um, uh, Mirapex and Requip. But it turns out Cinemet looks like it may actually be better. And that's why uh, we're using it more and more. And the next question is, is there a correlation between depression and sleeping a lot in the daytime? Um, there's a little bit of a correlation because one sign of depression is often daytime sleepiness, but it's not always the case. And there's lots of people with daytime sleepiness because of sleep troubles rather than mood troubles. So I think it's always important to take a careful history when you're trying to sort out whether someone has depression. The next question is, I take Benadryl both for the allergies and as a sleep aid. Are other antihistamines problematic? So Benadryl is probably the worst one, if I'm being honest. And although I almost never give medical advice in these Zooms, I, the one piece of medical advice I would give people is to avoid taking Benadryl unless, you, unless your doctor specifically told you you had to. And the other antihistamines like Zyrtec and Allegra, those are much safer. Those do not cause nearly, if any, of the cognitive symptoms that medicines like Benadryl do. Ah, the next question is, how do you define aerobic exercise? By heart rate, uh, uh, which aerobic exercises are best? So I think there's pretty good evidence in Parkinson's disease, maybe more than any other condition, that, that the aerobic exercise has to be pretty good. And by that, I mean it gets your heart rate up there pretty high. It doesn't have to be extreme. But, but moderate exercise that gets your heart rate up into the 110s or 120s, that's what we're looking for. One way to know you're doing it right is if you find yourself breathing pretty hard and maybe a little sweaty, that's the kind of exercise that we're talking about. Now, obviously, you should clear this with your doctor um, to make sure that it's safe for you to exercise. But for most people, their doctor will tell them absolutely and a moderate amount of extra, moderate intensity is what we're talking about. I think that this is one of the conditions that it's not a crazy idea to have like a Fitbit or an Apple Watch or something that can monitor your heart rate because you really wanna make sure your heart rate's getting into that 110 to 120 range for most people. That's what we mean by moderate exercise. And it can be whatever exercise you like. It could be swimming, walking quickly, uh, biking, uh, whatever, whatever uh, you'll, you'll, you'll enjoy and be able to stick with. 
I'm going to take a few more questions, but I'm going to start to wrap it up. Um, the next one was, um, can you speak more about the microbiome? Um, boy, yeah, no, I can't. There's a lot of studies going on about the microbiome and whether it's different in people with Parkinson's disease versus people not. But I don't think we yet know. And in the, in the, I think that in terms of nutrition, the main thing that I would emphasize is what we talked about, which is the Mediterranean diet. Are there any studies of gene therapies through CRISPR techniques for Parkinson's disease? Wow, geez, Louise, we're getting some, some really good questions. I do not know. For those who don't know, CRISPR is a technique to edit the genes of, of humans, and it has all kinds of implications. CRISPR has still mainly been studied in mice and rats, and I don't think that it's yet been done in humans, with the exception of a very rare trial for a very unusual neurologic disease. So I don't think it's yet ready for Parkinson's, but who knows how things will change in the future. I got some compliments. Thank you very much uh, to those who compliment me. I really appreciate it. What can you tell me about the drug Azelect or Resagiline in Parkinson's disease? Um, Azelect is one of the drugs that's been tested to see if it can slow the progression of Parkinson's disease. And it is, um, it is probably the, the medicine that has led to the most hemming and hawing on the part of movement disorders doctors. I often joke that if you go to a movement disorders conference and you go into the bar after the conference, you can start a good fight by saying, I believe resagiline is disease modifying because you'll get half the people say, no, it isn't. And the other half will say, yes, it is. And, uh, and it's hard to believe Parkinson's uh, doctors can get up in arms about this. But the data are very, very mixed. And, and the bottom line is uh, trial after trial, three massive trials of resagiline. We still don't know whether it's disease modifying or not, which means that certainly it's the case that if it is at all helpful, it's only minimally so. Um, Another question is, what do you mean by a misfolded protein? Um, so proteins are long strings of amino acids. And they, they, uh, the first thing that they do when you make them, when your body makes a, a protein, is the first thing it does is it folds up in a very interesting way. And the way it folds up uh, really has big implications for how well it functions. And it turns up, if it over time, folds in the wrong way, it can cause other proteins to then misfold in that wrong way. And you can see this in sort of the three-dimensional structure of the protein. If you look at, at special ways of taking pictures of proteins, and that's what we mean by, by misfolded. Thank you very much. I got some clapping. Isn't there Mediterranean plus? Um, how do you treat REM sleep behavior disorder is one of the questions. It turns out that one of, the, one of the easiest ways is melatonin, which is actually available over the counter, can help treat REM sleep uh, disorder. There is also uh, prescription medicines that can help, but they are often medicines that can make people sleepy, medicines like clonazepam. So we try to use those at the lowest doses, and generally we try to use melatonin first to see if that can work. There's a question about genes. And uh, that is a really complicated story in Parkinson's disease. There do, to be, there do seem to be some genes that can influence the risk of Parkinson's, but they're fairly small effect. And, uh, and I'd be uh, remiss if I didn't point out that Dave Simon, the head of our movement disorders group, is really a world expert in the genes that, and their relationship to Parkinson's. So I would stay tuned because I'm quite sure that he'd be happy to give a talk on that. So one, one person writes that, that, that their spouse is actually using the sleep apnea machine, but they're still tired during the day. When that happens, we do sometimes try to use medicines or even caffeine to try to help wake people up and have them be more alert. There are definitely medicines that can be used to promote alertness. Uh, okay, and I'm gonna answer one more question and then I am gonna hand the hosting duty back over to Stephanie. Uh, one question is, are levodopa and ribostigmine compatible? And the answer is yes, they can definitely both be used together. 
Um, and there's a complicated question about hallucinations in Parkinson's disease. And, uh, and the, the short answer there is, is, is certain of the Parkinson's disease medications can cause hallucinations. And so we often try to reduce those as low as we can go. But if you're as low as you can go on the Parkinson's medicines without the motor symptoms worsening, then we often use the medicines that we talked about, the cholinesterase inhibitors or even the atypical neuroleptics to treat them. So with that, boy, you have asked such excellent questions. I will make a copy of the slides available as a handout, as a PDF that can be distributed. And I would have loved to stay and answer all the questions, but literally I have to get on a conference call about COVID. Uh, so I am gonna go over here and I'm gonna find Stephanie and hand over to an alphabetical order. So that should make it easier. And I will, Oh, oh, panelists, I know what I have to do. And I will now make her a host. You ready, Stephanie? I'm ready. <laughs> Are you excited? You're going to be the host? Hold on. Hold on. You ready? Oh, it's the other way. I got, on my screen, it's when I go this way. <laughs> so there you go. I am changing the host. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm going to just mute myself and minimize the screen because if I, I'm afraid if I leave the meeting, it might, it might close it out. So. Okay. All right. Thank you. And thanks to everyone for joining me. Uh, I got one quick question at the beginning about COVID-19. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't say, I think people with Parkinson's disease, um, we certainly don't want them to get COVID, just like we don't want anyone to get COVID. But I have been trying to reassure my patients that Parkinson's disease is not, it's not one of the conditions that means that if you got COVID, it would be horrible. It's not like, like uh, people who have uh, cancer or immunocompromised or, or have very bad diabetes where they can really, if they develop COVID, it can be, uh, it's very likely to be life-threatening. Certainly, I want everyone to practice, um, I'll do my best Anthony Fauci imitation. Practice your social distancing. Wash your hands. <laughs> what else does he say? He's very, he's very clear. That was pretty good. <laughs> go. uh, but but I but I, I don't want you know it's a scary time for all of us and I, and I and I sometimes worry that people with Parkinson's disease um, it can be almost overwhelming the fear and I don't want that to be the case. So thank you all very much for your attendance and I will share the slides as a PDF with Stephanie and then I'll let Stephanie deal with how to disperse that. <laughs>